I want to assure everybody in the audience that for both Milton and me, our minds are in better shape than our bodies. <laughs> at least, at least I, I, hope, I hope that is true. I hope that is true. Um, I'm Barbara Mead. I think I've been introducing Milton for some 25 years. Um, I, like, I like to think that. I've always liked to follow Milton's career. Uh, and this evening, he has come to talk about his new book on the Middle East, Zionism. Uh, Kirkus, the Library Review, uh, has previewed Zionism as a well-written, balanced, and intriguing reference. Uh, during his undergraduate years at uh, Rutgers, uh, Milton won a Fulbright scholarship to go study in France. And when he returned to this country, he attended Harvard and then graduated from Columbia with a degree in journalism. And then he began a long and successful career writing articles, first about American politics, and during those years, he wrote a book called Liberalism with an introduction by Senator Hubert Humphrey. That was one of his earliest, earliest books. Um, uh, but then in 1967, Milton made his first trip to Israel. And uh, it was then that he had a somewhat violent personal reaction to what he sensed was the disparity between Israel's victory, um, uh, as a, a which he saw as ostensibly an opening to a stable uh, Middle East peace, and uh, on the other hand, the Israeli intoxication with the magnitude of their victory and their ensuing military dominance of the region. Uh, since then, uh, his absorption has produced five decades of countless articles uh, in all the major American media, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, and, so, and on and on. Um, and now, in, Zion, in writing Zionism, he has finally attempted to confront head-on uh, that uh, uh, initial uh, violent reaction that he had, um, and that is confront that in trying to resolve how did Zionism, over the course of a century, evolve from an idealism of providing refuge for beleaguered, is, is, for beleaguered Jews to a rationalization of the Israeli army's occupation of powerless Palestinians. Um, the, the French have their own unique name for the style of journalism that has become Milton's trademark, engagé. Uh, that's journalism reflecting a personal point of view without sacrificing <coughs> accuracy, as opposed to scholarly pursuits in a university setting, which Milton was originally attracted to, but then rejected. Uh, uh, as wearing his scholar, scholar's cap, though, Milton has been a senior scholar at the Middle East Institute and a Ferris prof professor at Princeton, Univer Princeton University. Wearing his journalist cap, he, he was awarded the Alicia Patterson Journalism Fellowship to research and write about Zionist and Islamic ideas and the Mideast crisis. But I think this evening it would be fair to say that Milton will be speaking as both a journalist and a scholar. So here is Milton to tell us about his new book, Zionism. Thank you, Milton. You probably think that this is a cane, but when you talk about the Middle East, you should always have a weapon. So, uh, but um, I'm just recovering. I apologize for the for the stumbling around, but um, but um, uh, I've just had a knee replaced, so that's why I really am carrying this thing with me. But it's a pleasure to be here, as it always is, at Politics and Prose among friends and neighbors and uh, the wonderful Barbara, who has been here for so long. Um, the first question that comes up in talking about this book is, well, do we need another book on Zionism? Because it's true that there are many. Um, but let me rephrase that question, as um, uh, Barbara suggested in the introduction. 
how did Zionism go from a humane vision for Jews um, to the milica military control of another people, of which almost the entire rest of the world disapproves? Uh, well, let me start by saying that I'm a Zionist. And it's true that over the years that many Jews have objected to my criticisms of Israeli policies, but that doesn't make me any less a Zionist. So what does that mean? Um, the common goal to which Zionists subscribe is a homeland where Jews can live uh, free of anti-Semitism in peace and security. Uh, the differences among Jews, and they are many and serious, are basically over how to go about it. My book fo focuses on the men whose fierce debates shaped Zionism and have never achieved a consensus. Well, the book opens with a prologue that looks at the Jews' so-called emancipation in the Enlightenment era and then moves quickly on to Theodore Herzl, the son of Jews who yearned to be assimilated into European society. Uh, Herzl, as, we all, as you all know, I'm sure, was the founder of modern Zionism. Um, oddly, he began with little fondness for Jews and even less for Judaism. Um, he loved German culture and as a failed playwright turned journalist, he was slow to recognize the vicious anti-Semitism engulfing Vienna where he lived. It was as a witness to the Dreyfus Affair while he was working in Paris that he became sensitive to the dangers. And in, 19, in 1896, he wrote the book called The Jewish State, his blueprint for Jewish nationhood. A Vienna's chief rabbi and assimilationist once asked Herzl how he could expect Europe's sophisticated Jews to live in Palestine growing vegetables. Uh, more prophetically, the rabbi warned Herzl that a Jewish state could become as nationalist and, and as militarist as any in Europe. Uh, Herzl paid no attention. His objective was singular. It was to find a home for Europe's increasingly threatened Jews. Well, the following year, 1897, Herzl convened the first World Zionist Congress in Basel. Western Europe's Jews barely noticed. Most of the several hundred who showed up as delegates were Jews living in East Europe um, under the Tsar, where the Enlightenment had hardly penetrated and where anti-Semitic pogroms were common. These Jews were strangers to Herzl. The Jews he knew were secular, while Eastern Jews wanted at least to preserve Jewish cultural values. Uh, an Orthodox contingent also at Basel determined to infuse Zionism with Torah Judaism. Well, Turchel, uh, Herzl argued for deferring indefinitely decisions on the, counter of the, on the character of the Jewish state. In 50 years, that will be plenty of time. In 50 years, he argued, a Jewish state will exist. He was off by only a single year. Herzl's strategy was to negotiate a charter with the Ottoman Sultan, which would give Zionism a legal standing in Ottoman Palestine. In return, he promised that rich Jewish financiers would make loans to the Sultan on favorable terms. In fact, however, he had no willing financiers, uh, nor did he understand that the Sultan rejected turning Palestine over to the Jews. But year after year, Herzl made vain trips back to Constantinople. Finally, with pogroms in Russia intensifying, Britain offered Zionism a charter for a colony in East Africa, which the East Europeans, that is the East European Jews, now Zionism's dominant ferns, force spurns on the spurned on the grounds that only Palestine was the Jewish home. Herzl died at age 44 in 1904, still puzzled by the Eastern Jews' response to Britain's offer and convinced that his efforts were a total failure. Well, they weren't. Though in the decade after his death, Zionism made a little headway. Then World War I broke out and the Ottoman Empire buckled and Palestine appeared up for grabs. Zionism spread all over Europe, 
resolved to avoid internal conflict by remaining officially neutral. But the Jews tended to, sign with the, to side with the state in which they lived. In England, a Russian-born chemist named Chaim Weizmann, who discovered a crucial component for improving Britain's battlefield munitions, emerged as Zionism's dominant figure. Weizmann gra grasped that both camps, that is the Allies, Britain, France, and Russia on the one hand, Germany, Austria, and Turkey on the other, saw America as likely to be the decisive factor in the war and believed that America's Jews could shape the outcome. Well, Britain had long been interested in Palestine and it gave many Britons pleasure to indulge the Jews. Britain entertained the idea that a Jewish Palestine, as part of its empire, could serve as a fixed barrier against foreign designs on the Suez Canal. Britain also had an active Christian aristocracy in which Lord Arthur Balfour, the foreign minister, was prominent. It endorsed the Old Testament's promise of Palestine to the Jews. Well, Weizmann brought to British <coughs> Weizmann brought to British deliberations on Palestine's future an uncanny ability to exploit the openings within British ruling class to promote the Zionist cause. The deliberations weren't easy. Though he had Balfour on his side, Weizmann also faced a community of assimilated British Jews, most of them descendants of the Iberian uh, migrants of the pre-Enlightenment era, who feared that Zionism would undermine their social positions. It should be noted, and may perhaps more, even more importantly, there is no record of an Arab voice in these deliberations, though Arabs were a majority in Palestine and had an army fighting alongside the British in the Middle East. Well, in November 1917, the cabinet issued the Balfour Declaration, announcing Britain's support for a Jewish national home in Palestine. To Weizmann's dismay, it also pledged to respect for the rights of the non-Jewish communities in Palestine, meaning the Arabs, a digression that he blamed on Britain's non-Zionist Jews. Well, the war was nearing an end when Weizmann journeyed to Palestine to set up uh, Zionist institutions under the occupying uh, British army he was surprised to find that British forces used to working with Muslims in India had few Zionist sympathies. General Allenby, their commander, anxious to finish off the Turks, asked Weizmann to reach out to the local Arabs to assure them that Zionism would do them no harm. Uh, convinced uh, the local Arabs, convinced that Britain had promised them their own nation after the war, their position was that the, that, the, um, that the Balfour Declaration was illegal and had to be rescinded. Weizmann duly, duly delivered the message that Allenby asked for, but the Arabs didn't believe a word he said. Soon afterward, Arab riots in Palestine broke out, shedding both Jewish and Arab blood. And since that time, as we all know, Jews and Arabs have engaged in virtually uninterrupted violence against each other. Weizmann made one serious, albeit misguided, effort at reaching a reconciliation with the Arabs. He crossed the desert into Jordan to meet with Prince Faisal, head of the Arab army, battling the Turks. Backed by his advisor, the celebrated Lawrence of Arabia, Faisal agreed to support the Jews' homeland in Palestine, but as a prophet province of an Arab state in Syria under his family's rule. The Palestine Arabs, however, contended that their country could not be given away, certainly not be given away by an Arab from distant Arabia. Weizmann returned to Jerusalem empty-handed from the desert in Jordan, then turned to the peace conference then convening in Paris, which proceed, proceeded under British influence to deliver a major commitment to the Zionist agenda. It's at this point that Vladimir Jabotinsky appears at the hub of the Zionist debates. 
I'll jump ahead to say that though he is barely known to Americans, it is Jabotinsky's shadow more than any other that hovers over Zionism today. Born in Odessa in 1880, Jabotinsky, like many Russian Jews, was excluded from the Russian university system and wound up in Rome where he studied some law while becoming the admirer of Western democracy as well as the swashbuckling Garibaldi and the Italian independence movement. On returning home, he encountered a new round of pogroms in, in Odessa and was active in organizing self-defense units, which, which was his introduction to Zionism. A talented writer, Jabotinsky is most remembered for declaring that, and I quote, of all the necessities for national rebirth, shooting is the most important. <laughs> he, brought to Zion, he brought to Zionism a dedication to arms, which it has never given up. On a newspaper assignment at the start of World, at the start of World War I, Jabotinsky found several hundred young Russian Jews expelled by the Turks from Palestine in Alexandria. He proposed they organize a legion to fight alongside the British, the British to liberate Palestine, but the local British commander proposed instead a Zionist mule corps to serve an impending landing at Gallipoli on the Turkish coast. Reluctantly and a bit insulted, Jabotinsky took the offer the mule, call, the, mule, the mule Corps served bravely, but after, after the battle, the British, suspicious of Jabotinsky's intent, disbanded it. A few years later, Jabotinsky managed to replace it with the Jewish Legion, his dream, in which he was a combat officer. The Legion was the, Jew, the Jews' first fighting unit since biblical times. It also served with distinction. Well, after the armistice in 1918, Britain demobilized the Jewish Legion as it had the Mule Corps. Jabotinsky then proceeded to organize Jewish units to defend against the Arabs, modeled, under the, modeled on the units in Russia that aimed at thwarting the pogroms. The British would not tolerate that plan either and imprisoned Jabotinsky and some of his soldiers. Jabotinsky took his case to the British courts and his success made him a hero among Jews worldwide. But it also sent a message that the Balfour pledges were already in retreat. In 1923, Jabotinsky published an article called The Iron Wall, which proposed that the Jews take over responsibility from the British for establishing a homeland, a homeland in all of historic Palestine and maybe a little more on the side. He urged Jews to dismiss the view that, and I quote, the Arabs are fools whom we can deceive by masking our real aims. We may water down and sweeten our aims with honeyed words to make them palatable, but they know what we want, just as we know what they do not want. He predicted that the Arabs would one day come to an agreement with the Jews but not of their own free will. Only Jewish military prowess will convince them, he said, that they cannot get rid of us. Well, by now, well, by now Jabotinsky and Weizmann were ideological adversaries. Weizmann admired Jabotinsky, but he had no intention of giving up on the British in whom he had invested so much of himself. Meanwhile, a new center of power created by the Balfour Direct Declaration was rising in Palestine's Jewish community, and Weizmann's preeminence in the Zionist movement was step by step eroding. The emerging leader of this community was David Ben Gurion, whose own vision of a Jewish homeland was now to create was now creating a three way rivalry for Zionist leadership. So Russian born like Weizmann and Jabotinsky, Ben-Gurion chose not to emulate their Europe-oriented lives. At age 20, he migrated to Palestine. After working as a field hand, which he hated, he dabbled in socialist politics, which he loved, then decided to attend law school in Constantinople. 
When the war began, he declared his loyalty to the Turks. But the Turkish authorities were dubious since most of Palestine's Jews were still citizens of Russia, the enemy. Ben-Gurion was among the hundreds deported to Egypt as what we call today security risks. In Egypt, Ben-Gurion met Jabotinsky, who invited him to join the Mule Corps. But he contended that the Jews, even indirectly, should not be allied with Russia, much less participate in an attack that would justify Turkish opinion of, of Palestine's Jews. Under British suspicion as a pro-Turk, he was caught between two enemies and left for New York. In 1917, when the Tsar was overthrown, he enlisted in the Jewish Legion and was sent to Palestine, but arrived too late to participate in combat. At the war's end, Ben-Gurion leaped back into Zionist politics, determined to found institutions built on democratic socialism that would provide the background for the forthcoming Jewish state. He never envisaged bringing the Palestinian Arabs into the state. Herzl had extolled the, the benefits to Arabs of Zionist rule, but Ben-Gurion regarded this as a Herzl delusion. Only a small Jewish communist sect believed in integrating the two peoples, and Ben-Gurion was no communist. His vision was of parallel societies in which a Jewish state took care of the Jews while the Arabs were free to do what they like going off on their own. Climbing the political ladder, Ben-Gurion proved an excellent organizer, and over the ensuing years he was instrumental in founding the Labor Party, establishing a Jewish National Assembly, and creating the unique Zionist organization called Histadrut, which was part labor union, part industrial corporation, part social welfare society. The Arabs, though urged by the British to create competitive institutions, stuck to their principles in protesting the mandate's illegality. And while Jews erected the framework of their forthcoming state, the Arabs built nothing, effectively denying themselves the tools to influence Palestine's course. Jabotinsky thought Ben-Gurion was wasting his time on institutions as long as the Jews lacked possessions of the land, and he considered Weizmann a total sellout to Britain. Gradually, he cut his ties to organized Zionism while seeking to recruit, recruit young Jews for the liberation. In 1925, he convoked what he called a Conference of Zionist Revisionists in Paris, whose aim was to shift Zionism to an aggressive course. In time, revisionism was secede from Zionism completely, producing a schism that has never healed. In the mid-1920s, Jabotinsky embraced Beza, Betar, a Zionist youth organization whose hub was in Palestine, where it had, excuse me, whose hub was in Poland, where it had ties to the right-wing Polish regime. In time, he became its chief, relying on its thousands of members as a military spearhead while moving steadily away from his commitment to liberal democracy. In 1929, Beitaris triggered riots throughout Palestine by disrupting, Arab, by disrupting Arab prayers at Jerusalem's Wailing Wall. Hundreds of Jews and Arabs died in these disorders. Soon after the 1929 riots, when he was away in Europe, Britain's mandatory chiefs issued an order denying Jabotinsky a visa to enter Palestine, and he never set foot in the country again. In his final years, he blamed both Britain, both Britain and the Zionist structure for his alienation, and in 1933, he crossed the Rubicon, emulating Europe's despots in declaring that he alone would make all decisions for his movement. The revisionist membership dutifully endorsed him in his plebiscite. Ben-Gurion, alluding to Jabotinsky's fondness for Italy, uh, now led by Mussolini, 
responded that revisionism was, and I quote, a putrid weed drawing sustenance from a befouled source. <coughs> well, at this point, Jabotinsky and Ben Gurion recognize that their mutual has. <coughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. I'll just put that there. Uh, at this point, Jabotinsky and Ben Gurion recognized that their mutual antagonism was doing great harm to Zionism. And in the fall of 1934, they held a series of secret meetings in London in which they worked out a series of pledges, uh, in quotes, to refrain from party warfare and resolve our differences in conformity with civilized conduct. Uh, ratification, however, was another matter. Jabotinsky rammed approval for, through the Revisionist Congress, but Ben-Gurion, with much less control over his multitude, was, a, was unable to contain its brewing anger and lost badly in a referendum. The failure of the effort at reconciliation was a lasting blow to Zionism. It was just as Hitler was coming to power, and that's when Jabotinsky seceded from the Zionist organization. Um, Zionism with revisionism now on the outside was deeply divided against itself. In 1936, with Zionism growing desperate to open Palestine's doors to endangered Jews in Europe, the Arabs launched a new revolt directed against any British concessions to Zionism, especially immigration. With the revisionist militia Irgun, uh, and the mainstream Jewish force, the Haganah, which it's interesting to note, both of which were founded by Jabotinsky, combined to fight the Arabs. The British, however, were paralyzed. The cabinet in London then sent the Peel Commission to find a solution and wound up recommending the partition of Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. The offer violated the Zionist and the Arab dreams of statehood. And both Jabotinsky and the Arabs rejected it. But Ben-Gurion and Weizmann agreed that even a small Jewish state had a hope of saving at least some European Jews. The cabinet, however, settled the matter, rejecting both, particip both partition and a loosening of immigration. Rubbing the, med rubbing the message in a little bit, Britain published the decision in a white paper the day of the Nazi program called Kristallnacht. Well, in September 1939, the Nazis invaded Poland and World War II was on. Ben-Gurion summed up the Jewish position in his epigram, we shall wage war against Hitler as if there were no white paper, and wage war against the white paper as if there were no Hitler. The Jews sent recruits to fight beside the British and, f and furnish the army with food and supplies while the Arabs leaned increasingly toward Germany. Revisionist extremists, sometimes called the Stern Gang, opened a guerrilla war against the British as early as 1942. And as the Allied victory over the Nazis clearly was approaching, the Irgun joined them. By then, Jabotinsky had died of a heart ailment and was su succeeded by Menachem Begin a disciple whose ide ideology was even more, was more extreme than that of his mentor. Well, in 1947, Britain formally gave up its mandate, and the UN voted to divide Palestine into two sovereign states. In May 1948, Ben-Gurion declared Israel's independence, and the Jews' war against the Arabs began. Ben-Gurion and Begin agreed, in theory, to, un to unify their forces, but they were unable to agree on a command structure. Begin demanded the autonomy to give orders to the revisionist troops. Ben-Gurion's goal was to forge a government, and he insisted all Jewish forces serve under a central command. In 1946, Irgun bombed the King David Hotel, the British headquarters. And during the siege of Jerusalem, Mass massacred hundreds of Arabs civilians in the village named Deir Yassin. Most traumatic, 
was the fight over the Altalina, a ship with Jabotinsky's pen name that brought Beitar recruits and heavy weapons unannounced to Palestine, leading Ben-Gurion to suspect a plot to overthrow the state. When Begin refused to yield the cargo, the Haganah attacked, attacked the sinking ship. Dozens of Jewish lives were lost along with his full cargo of arms. The King David, Ta'ir Yassin, and the Altalina remain original sins etched upon the nation's Jewish state. Now, we all know about Ben-Gurion's skillful management of the War of Independence, and I won't dwell on it. Um, Israel defeated first the Palestinians, then the armies of the Arab countries. It increased Israel's territory by some 20 percent and reduced Palestine's Arab population by roughly half. Whole communities fled after Deir Yassin, while many others were driven out on Ben-Gurion's direct orders, creating a refugee population in the Middle East that has since grown into millions. Nor did the ceasefire between Israel and the Arab states in 1949 end the mayhem. Combat continued along the fluid borders, much of it at the instigation of Ben-Gurion, who was ever ready to use his military forces to impose the Jewish state's dominance of its neighbors. Oddly, Ben-Gurion chose not to seize the West Bank when he could have done so. One reason was that the Jordanian legion that held the area was commanded by British officers, and the Israeli army had no desire to risk a war with Britain. Ben-Gurion also recognized that hundreds of thousands of Arabs who lived in the West Bank <clears throat> many of them angry refugees, would divert resources from the Holocaust survivors whom the state had a commitment to integrate. Begin was furious with the decision, and 20 years later, the captured West, uh, West Bank reemerged as an issue in the Six-Day War. Its fate, that is, the fate of the West Bank, has since kept the region in a state of relentless instability. <clears throat> Israel was intoxicated by its victory in the Six-Day War, then scared witless by the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Together, these wars transformed the societies. Militant forces long in hibernation emerged to demand retaining the West Bank. Ben-Gurion, Begin, and the revisionists, of course, had been waiting for just such an opportunity since Jabotinsky, but there were also others. Much of Israel's triumphant military contended that security would not permit returning any territory to the Arabs. But unforeseen, there also arose a fiery religious movement, heir to the religious Zionists of the Herzl era. For decades, little had been heard of them, even though Rav Avraham Isaac Cook the Ashkenazi chief rabbi, and his son, Rabbi Svi Yehuda Cook, preached that the land of Palestine was even holier than the Torah. The father died in 1935, but the son and his apostles, many of them trained in the family yeshiva, sparked Gush Emonim, a group that defied the state in building religious settlements throughout the occupied territories. In 1977, as this new wave of Israeli thinking spread, voters overthrew their long-standing commitment to Ben-Gurion's Labor Party and elected the revisionist Menachem Begin to be the prime minister. Begin's election looked at first like an aberration, reflecting the blame popularly attributed to labor for Israel's near collapse in the Yom Kippur War. But blame for the near defeat was only part of the explanation. Israel's political change coincided with the change in the electorate. In addition to the revisionists, a generation of Sephardim, that is, the Jews from the Arab lands, had reached maturity. And they were resentful that the Ben-Gurion camp had for too long ruled as if by natural right. They were joined by the religious Zionists moving toward a religious fundamentalism 
that seem to be settling in and setting up, as well as setting up beachheads throughout much of the world. Finally, Jews from the Soviet Union, with no ties to liberal democracy at all, were, were arriving in large numbers and would soon re reach a fifth of Israel's population. Combined, these Israelis rejected Ben-Gurion's establishment. Begin was not just the revisionist foe, he was the non-establishment alternative who appeared at a time when a majority of Israelis had grown weary of the establishment. Begin led Israel into an anti-establishment era where a majority of voters stand today. Begin's achievement was to make peace with Egypt, though he outraged religious Zionists as well as his own revisionists by giving up Jewish colonies in Egypt's Sinai. But his rejection of concessions to the Palestinians, along with resentment expansion of settlements, ended any chances of an accord with the Palestinians on the West Bank. Faithful to Jabotinsky, Begin seized on Egypt's withdrawal from the conflict to attack Lebanon in 1982 to crush the PLO, which he considered the barrier to Israel's domination over the Palestinians. The Lebanon War was a military failure, and its, head, and its heavy casualties led not just to Begin's resignation, but to a huge wound in Israel's good name in the global community. Well, Benjamin Netanyahu, as we all know, has dominated Israeli politics ever since. There were other prime ministers, most notably Yitzhak Rabin, an ex-general, whose effort to make, make peace ended in his murder by a religious Zionist claiming inspiration from the rabbis of the Cook School. But it was revisionism that brought a second deadly war in Lebanon, three bloody intifadas, and three bu brutal invasions of Gaza, an astonishing record. The record might make, might have made Jabotinsky proud, but wouldn't Herzl ask what happened to the secure Jewish homeland to which he had dedicated his life? Netanyahu, as many of you know, is the son of a revisionist historian who was serving as a secretary to Jabotinsky when he died in New York in 1940. Netanyahu learned English at schools in America where his father taught. On returning to Israel, he served in the army, then entered revisionist politics. He was Israel's ambassador to the United Nation, then became the leader of Likud, the revisionist political party. Elected prime minister after Rabin's murder, he was defeated for re-election in 1999, then his announced his retirement from politics to go into business. But his retirement was brief and much of it was spent in writing a book, uh, ironically entitled A Durable Peace, uh, in which he denied any Arab claim whatever to Palestine. When Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, the ex-military hero who had assembled the coalition that, uh, that became Likud, chose to withdraw from Gaza in the face of rising casualties of the first Intifada, Netanyahu led a party rebellion that ousted him and restored his own leadership. Netanyahu was re-elected prime minister in 2009 and has since held the office, imbuing it with a dedication, despite some occasional verbal equivocation, to Israel's permanent military rule over the three or four million Arabs now living in Jerusalem and the West Bank. Well, that gets us where we are today, and I'd like to end by returning briefly to Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion was no saint. He was a practical man. So why, that being the case, has it been so hard in our time to distinguish Ben-Gurion's disciples from Jabotinsky's? It was Jabotinsky, after all, who declared that once Jews demonstrated their military superiority, the Arabs would change their minds about peace. Surely it can be argued that the Arabs have changed their minds, but neither Ben-Gurion's 
nor Jabotinsky's camp has shown an interest and a serious quest to end the conflict. In the most recent Israeli election last year, there was not even a credible peace party. Has the tragedy of Jewish history forever scoured our psyches, the Jewish collective psyche, making rational political judgments impossible? Will Israel ever be able to choose peace over military domination? Nachum Goldman, a peace advocate who once led the World Zionist Organization, wrote in his memoir about a late night conversation with Ben-Gurion over coffee and sandwiches after his retirement to the Negev. Uh, the subject was peace. Goldman recalls Ben-Gurion's musing, why should the Arabs make peace? If I was an Arab leader, I never would. That is natural. We have taken their country from them. So we have to stay strong and maintain a powerful army. That is why I never shrank from giving orders, which I knew would mean the death of hundreds of wonderful young men. Otherwise, the Arabs will wipe us out. Goldman, like most of us, credited Ben-Gurion for the framework that made Israel a modern, prosperous, democratic state. But in conditions of endless war, he asked, how long can it survive? Ben-Gurion replied, Ask me whether my son Amos, who will soon be 50, has a chance of dying and being buried in a Jewish state. And I would answer, 50-50. Ben-Gurion then asked, excuse me, Goldman then asked, But how can you sleep with that prospect in mind? Ben-Gurion hesitated a moment and then replied, Who says I sleep? Thank you. And I will be happy to answer any questions. Okay, or... we've got about 15 minutes for questions, and we've got two mics. We've got one here, one here. If people with questions will please go to the mic. Thanks. Let me take the risk of asking the first question. Do you see any possible solution, long-term peaceful solution to the current conflict? And do you think the United States can play a constructive role in that attempt? Um, I think the um, second part of your question was um, uh, more important than the first part of your question. And yes, I think the United States must play a constructive role. Uh, there can be no peace without uh, American involvement. Um, we supply a great deal of money to Israel. We supply much of its arms. We supply a diplomatic background. We are, uh, uh, one could argue that Europe, that, that Israel would be in terrible trouble without the United States. And we had presidents who seemed to understand capture a glimmer of that, but when it came right down to it, um, not our present president, uh, whom I love, but who was um, a grievous failure on making peace in the Middle East, or any of the other presidents. So I think there, yes, I think there is a possibility of peace in the Middle East. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be wasting 50 years of my life <laughs> on the subject. Um, but um, I think it will require a great deal of coercive, although perhaps delicate, but delicately coercive force on the part of the American government. Otherwise, it's just never going to happen. That's a conclusion I've reached after a very long time of being involved in the subject. And I, much as I think about it, I can't come up with any other answer. Yeah, if um, thank you. If you were Benjamin Netanyahu, 
and you knew that you were going to get a $40 billion deal for 10 years, which is more than the last deal you got for $30 billion over 10 years, why would you ever agree to any kind of delicate pressure from the United States if you're just getting that reward of $40 billion? Um, would you direct this question to President Obama or <laughs> no to you <laughs> to or Mrs. or to Mrs. Clinton, who was deeply involved in this as Secretary of State for a long time? The answer is there is no reason. I mean, why wh why should he in in, in um, as um, as a, um, a leader, notwithstanding the contradiction of his ideology, the conflict between his ideology and the American ideology? increasingly, uh, why should he um, uh, not take the deal, put it in his pocket, and go home? And that's what he's going to do. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 it's, it's interesting because I should have all the answers. I've been working on this for a very long time um, and very conscientiously. But the fact is, I sometimes, and, and you know, and I'm a, I, am, I am a faithful citizen and a good Democrat and all that sort of thing, and I still don't understand why we wind up doing the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, not just because it is, I don't think, in Israel's interest, but in our own interest. We are, we are perpetuating a situation of total instability in the Middle East, which is as harmful to us, I believe, as it is to Israel. Oh, excuse me. Hi. Hi, Mr. Bjorst. Um, Hi. Oh, could you put the mic oh, down? Mike, 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 excuse me. Um, um, let me try to expand this, realizing that you are also a student of history in general, starting out with a book on, a book on Western civilization. Um, have you ever thought of the resemblance between what is going on in the Middle East with all these young people desperately wanting their own territory, their own identity to what's going on all over the world? Have you ever thought of, of a moral equivalent of war or anything like that that could perhaps apply to many young people? Well, I think increasingly about it. I'm not sure I have very many good answers on that one either. But uh, the fact is that, yes, uh, um, uh, there are things going on now which, including the present election, which leads me to wonder about the irrationality of, um, of, of so much in international affairs. And um, uh, I would like to bring my own rationality to any positions of power that I can influence, but I haven't been very good at it. Okay. But you're going to keep writing. Okay, please. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your marvelous talk. Um, why do you think Oslo collapsed? Why, I'm sorry, did, why do you think Oslo collapsed and the negotiations collapsed? And what do you think of the BDS movement? Uh, I think Os Oslo collapsed. I'm not sure that Os Oslo would have survived uh, even um, uh, even without uh, Rabin's murder. I think that Rabin was at the top of a very, very fragile structure. And um, he may not have ever, I mean, Ra Rabin, as I recall, had a 61-59 majority in the Knesset. It would be very hard for him to uh, push through any legislation that would um, require uh, large numbers of Jews to leave the West Bank. It sounded good, and I, and I can only cheer um, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, but I cannot say that had he lived, the world would have been different. The course of events would have been different. I'm not sure we'd, we'd, we'd have wound up in the right place. But why did it collapse? Why did it collapse? Because he didn't have the structure underneath him to keep it together. And when he was absent by, by virtue of his being murdered, there was nobody to take his place. Um, he was succeeded briefly by um, by um, Paris, by by Shimon Peres, who did a terrible job in um, in trying to keep. He, he he tried his best, but 
he tried. He tried. I don't know if sure he tried his best. He tried a little bit and failed <laughs> to um, to keep um, to keep the Oslo process going and failed. Um, and it it collapsed because there was no foundation to it. I mean, I think that's the answer to it. And you know, and the fact is, there was no great there was no great effort made on the United States to keep it going. Uh, and that would have been necessary. As far as BDS is concerned, uh, always a tricky question. But um, I would say uh, I am opposed to BDF, BDS, uh, not for the reasons most people, many people are, but because I believe that BDS has a limited potential for changing the course of events in the Middle East, but has a great potential for driving Jews crazy um, for the reasons I cited before, having to do with, with um, um, our collective psyches, the product of a great deal of, of uh, tragic events over the course of time. And, <clears throat> And, and, and we are just, we, the Jews, are trying, simply trying to make BDS another, uh, an, another event in this long sequence. So I, um, I think we ought to forget BDS and go off on another course, not because there isn't a certain amount of nobility to BDS and not because it didn't demonstrate a great deal of effectiveness in South Africa. It did, but the fact is I'm not sure that it would work uh, in, the, in, 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 in Israel. Thank you. Question. Yes, sir. As if it weren't complicated enough, the struggles between the Sh uh, Shia and Sunni in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and so on, seem to complicate things further. Uh, you didn't spend much time thinking or mentioning a, what you thought about their role in how Israel, Palestine, and the United States will respond to those pressures. I'm sorry, I don't understand the focus of your question. Would you tell me? All of the other countries in the Middle East are now in turmoil as well. Yes. And how, are, how do you see the balance of those conflicts playing out? Well, if you, if you don't accuse me of plagiarizing Martin Luther King, I have a little dream. Uh, <laughs> and one of them is that if there is an um, Israeli-Palestinian agreement um, almost necessarily negotiated uh, with a certain amount of coercion by the United States, but, but, um, but if there is um, some sort of an agreement, it becomes one piece in the mosaic of the Middle East. It shows that something could be done about a, a region which is now in total turmoil and when there is no obvious exit from what's going on now. Uh, I think that um, uh, there would be a great deal of gratitude on the part of uh, Arabs um, to provide an example on how uh, uh, some kind of progress can be made on restoring stability in the Middle East. Um, and I think that churning up the Palestinian-Israeli conflict more and more and more only only feeds the um, the hunger the, the of 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 the of the of the of the people who are promoting disorder throughout the region. Hi, um, you've talked a, a couple times now about gentle coercion. About coercion, gentle pressure, coercion on the part of the United States right. towards peace. Um, I was at a talk recently at the synagogue over on Macomb Street, and I've forgotten the name of the author and his book, but he's a psychologist, psychiatrist from New York, writing about the Israeli psyche, which he describes both the good qualities and the negative qualities being essentially oppositional, and that any influence that's put pressure on from the outside, they're going to resist, whether it's something they eat, even if it's something they like, they're going to resist it if it comes from the outside. And when people asked what he thought um, might be done, it, he's, he mentioned the cutting off of funding them. I, you've, you've already expressed that you don't think that will happen, that people here keep making the same mistake and doing the same thing, giving them 
the $10 million a day, but don't you think we should put more pressure on them? That's one of the points Jewish Voice for Peace is asking for, is to stop giving any aid to Israel. Well, I think that there are uh, a lot of Israelis who would be very grateful for this kind of pressure from the United States, and a lot of Israelis who feel they have been let down by the failure of the United States to provide this kind of policy. Um, I wish we would do it. I, um, I uh, have not um, quite figured out how we are going to get any of the present presidential candidates uh, to, uh, uh, to take on that kind of practice. Um, um, so you talked quite a bit about the intellectual le legacy of revisionism taking over. I'm, I'm sorry. I I, I'm you talked quite a bit about the intellectual legacy of revisionism taking over Israeli politics at yes. present. Yes. Um, obviously, the Israeli left is in crisis, not only institutionally in the Zionist Union coalition, but also just sort of as uh, the popular trends gen generally in terms of popular perception of both the Gaza withdrawal and the failure of the Oslo Accords leading to the Second Intifada, um, when so many Israelis hold um, that, that those actions were, were led, led to tragedy and, and, and these sort of attempts at peace should not be, be taken again and coupled with the demographic trends in terms of both the religious population and the Arab population surging and, and the secular population in somewhat decline, what do you see as a, a realistic uh, space for the is Israeli left at present? A realistic space like for what the Israeli left yes. is that what you said well needless to say the Israeli left has been a great disappointment and I think that uh, what used to be thought of as the peace camp really isn't anymore there are um, a few uh, people of some note um, in the Israeli peace camp who are st still faithful to it but the Labor Party which always represented a m much more practical course even since Ben-Gurion's time, whatever the failures of Ben-Gurion, um, uh, the Israeli left is, seems to have abdicated any sense of responsibility about all of this. And I, I, I just, you know, I, I, I look to a certain number of young people within, um, uh, within Israeli politics, but I don't see any... Um, signs that would permit me to predict that the future is theirs. You know, although, you know, the odd part about it is we, we sometimes forget that um, uh, Netanyahu's margin uh, of, um, uh, uh, in the Knesset is still 61-59. It's very slight, but probably any, any, any fluctuating force is going to be to his right, as we know, rather than to his left. Uh, we just simply do not have, and um, um, uh, we, don't, we, we, just don't, we just don't have an opposition force of any consequence in Israel. And I blame, in some considerable measure, I blame the United States that we have not given them any reason to be optimistic. Um, I think if we, uh, ever since the beginning of Zionism, it's been clearly understood that Israel could not exist without the support of a major Western power. Well. The only major Western power at this point that that meets those that has those credentials is the United States, and it's not doing its job. And so uh, I can understand why the left tends to walk away from the challenge, and it does walk away from the challenge. Uh, and I think that the only th way we can get them back together again is not for President Obama to uh, in, uh, ratify. A, um, a, a, a marvelous new charitable donation that will exist over the course of the next time for Israel, but give them what they need for security, but with a clear understanding that there are two sides to this story, that we have interest too, that we are concerned about this. We don't think that this is good for us. Uh, and if you want our tanks and planes and money and support at the United Nations, you are going to have to recognize that you're going to have to give some ground. And Netanyahu's, me the message that Netanyahu has received over the course, well, since he's been reelected um, in the early part of the century, is that he can get away with it. He got away with it in Congress during the speech, and he got away with it in, uh, in, in countless other ways. 
and um, and there is no reason why any re legitimate politician would not take advantage of that, and he does. Okay, we're beginning to run out of time. I think we've got one question here, and how many questions over here? Two? Mm -hmm. Okay, we got three more questions, and then we have to close down. Thanks. How do you reconcile, how do you reconcile your view of an intransigent Israel with the rejection by Arafat of most all the lands of Israel before uh, the war, and with the withdrawal of the Israelis from the Gaza, only to be met with missiles and tunnels? Well, that's a that's a question that that deserves uh, more than a quick than a quick attention. The fact is that. Um, uh, Arafat basically followed the course that Jabotinsky predicted. And uh, he was a totally fiery, um, revolutionary uh, guerrilla warrior who understood after a certain point that if his people were going to be able to live any kind of normal life, he would have to give ground. And he did give ground. I mean, it is, it is absurd to maintain that he maintained his original world vision throughout his lifetime. He did not. I mean, by the time he died, he, he, he wanted to make peace, but it turned out to be too late. Um, and I think that um, uh, we have a great deal of reason to regret that. And I think that um, um, we have to defer to Jabotinsky on a whole other range of problems. I, I, I cannot say that I have a huge admiration for Abu Mazen. Who is, the, who is Arafat's successor, but he too has not um, been given much reason to, um, to feel that uh, um, there, is, there is a prospect of a successful negotiation going on there. Uh, what was the, there was one little other- the Gaza. Pardon me? The withdrawal from Gaza. The withdrawal from Gaza was, was uh, Ariel Sharon decided to withdraw from Gaza after the, the casualties in the Intifada became so heavy. And he saw, he too, I mean, God, I mean he, he was the revisionist revisionist, even though he was brought up as a Labor Party member. But he, was, uh, but he understood finally at a certain point, uh, in a sense, the same thing that, that, that Arafat understood, that if, there, that if Jews and Arabs were going to live together, there had to, be, there had to be some sort of reconciliation, there had to be some concession on both parts. And, but, but Sharon refused to go the whole way. I mean, he, he insisted upon withdrawing Israeli uh, settlements from Gaza, of which there were 15,000 uh, more or less, as opposed to um, um, uh, several hundred thousand in the West Bank. Um, but at the same time, he imposed, without any resistance from the, from the rest of the government or from the United States, this terrible, this terrible blockade of Gaza, which has existed since that time. And that wasn't a withdrawal from Gaza. It was just changing the terms of the occupation. Well, Israel is now offering an airport to Gaza. Well, that should be very nice, and that will be very helpful. <laughs> Having destroyed the last airport, it would be very nice if they, uh, <laughs> if they built a new one. And the same thing is true with a port. They are offering a new port to Gaza uh, yes. with certain limitations, and I understand it. Some of the limit. I mean, there are, there, are, there are certainly legitimate security concerns on Israel's, on Israel's part. I don't dispute that for a okay. moment. But I certainly uh, uh, cannot for a moment endorse the notion that we can solve the problem by tightening the blockade, by not allowing um, uh, materials as well as human beings to come in and out. I mean, it, there was a moment when we, Gene Bird and I came down, we, we landed in that airport, didn't we, once uh, on one of our trips? And it looked very hopeful. Uh, Gaza seemed to be uh, moving in the right direction, but that didn't last. Hi. Um, I, was, I had the good fortune to be in Israel and Palestine last summer as part of an interfaith peace delegation, and we had an opportunity to talk to a lot of Palestinians, a lot of Israelis, some settlers, people who lived on kibbutzes, etc. 
many people there have the view that really the only solution is a one-state solution, not a two-state solution. I'd be interested in your view of that. Well, you know, I, 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 I think the one-state solution is a beautiful idea, which, which, which the more you shake it reveals how absurd it actually is. Uh, I, I mean, if, if, um, if Jews and Arabs are fighting each other in separate jurisdictions, if they are in the same jurisdictions and, um, and, um, and uh, um, involved in the same elections and, and, and uh, uh, debating in the Knesset every day, I can only imagine that it would be simply, I mean, this is my guess, I would think that it would simply um, uh, take the violence uh, uh, from the left hand and transfer it to the right. I don't think it would change anything significant at all. I think your friend over here has something to say, um, and then we'll do one last question. This is Gene Bird, who was very oh. one of my many one of my mentors, and I'm lucky <laughs> he has been in my life for many many years. Twenty five years out there, uh, haven't learned a thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I noticed two things about your book. I've only pasted it a little bit. I don't know. You don't mention the generals and how many of them have come out very strongly for a different peace process. And secondly, can you comment on the Russian influence on in all of this, particularly with regard to Assad and the new Syrian government whenever it is created. Gene, I'm trying to be a scholar and you're making <laughs> me go back into journalism. Uh, uh, um, look, look into the future. What, <laughs> what would you suggest? Well, listen, I mean, the, the, the statement on the part of the generals has got to be, I mean, there have been repeated statements and there's been this wonderful movie which probably, probably many of you saw um, of the uh, of the retired uh, heads of the Mossad. Uh, the I'm sorry, what? The gatekeepers. The gatekeepers. Uh, yeah, I mean, Israel is, not a, Israel is not intellectually monolithic. There is a lot going on. It's just where the power lies. And so far, um, the Jabotinsky crowd is, is ahead and, and, and are not seriously threatened. Um, as far as the Russians are concerned, I'll leave that to you. <laughs> okay, we've got one last question here. Milton, I haven't, I haven't written on this subject, but as a former member of Congress for 26 years, I've thought about it a lot. And I want to ask you a strictly political question. Could you talk just a little louder? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk into the mic. Tell us your name. Martin Frost. I was, uh, I've, I've, right. I've been in your home, Milton. I, we, are, we, were, we were honored by your presence. Yes. Um, this is a political question. Um, Non-Jewish Democratic politicians in this country are intimidated by loud voices which represent a minority of the American Jewish community, intimidated into showing how strongly they support Israel and not being willing to speak out forcefully uh, for a, a two-state solution. Uh, there clearly is very significant opinion in the American Jewish community that favors a two-state solution. How do we resolve this? How do we make the people who are in my party and your party who are running for national office not be intimidated by the loud voices in the Jewish community on the other side and the reason they're intimidated is that they are worried in a close election the Republicans could take 10 or 15 percent more of the Jewish vote and we would lose the election. Um, my answer to that is, um, um, what do we do about the NRA? I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, we know that there are, there are uh, at least two major lobbies in the American political system, which exercise a hugely disproportionate amount of power um, to the detriment you and I, and probably most of us in this room, would agree 
um, to the detriment of the American people, um, and, and yet they continue to exercise it. Uh, uh, I would think that both of the NRA and the, the right-wing Jewish lobby is currently in retreat, but at a very slow pace. Um, but uh, let's meet again in 10 years and <laughs> see you. Okay, thank, thank you, Milton. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful evening.